I'm about to talk to you guys about why the income danger zone is so pervasive in America and why there are so many people who are in the position to be globally reset. First of all, I'm a big nerd, so I spend a lot of time diving into statistics. And one of the things that you, and you just live in your life, you don't really research this stuff, you don't know about it, is that 70% of America is in the income danger zone. Now, what is the income danger zone? The income danger zone is an income, single person income, single person income, not household income, but single person income of less than $50,000 a year because after taxes, which is about 12,000, 15,000, that only leaves you about take home pay of 3,000 bucks a month. And if you're 50,000 or less, you are in the income danger zone. Now, I went ahead when I used to have the other channel, Savage Finance. I'm really thinking about restarting another personal finance channel at the beginning of the year. I'll let you guys know about that. But when I went through the classifications of the income danger zones, and most of America is an income danger zone number one, which is less than $50,000, which explains why there are so many people who are positioned to economically go down during the global reset. Because if you were unaware and you didn't know these numbers, it doesn't make any sense what's going on. But if you really knew the numbers, it makes a lot of sense what's going on and what's happening right now. So one of the, the big things that is happening is that people are what I like to call economically fragile. What is economically fragile? When you're economically fragile, you're just teetering on the edge of being okay or complete devastation. Being okay or complete economic devastation. So one of the things that happens to the people who are in income danger zone number one is all it takes is one life event to wreck their financial house. And this is why so many people are about to be globally reset. The things that you're seeing in 2021 are nothing compared to what you will see in 2022 and in 2023 and 2024. This isn't going to disappear or turn around or the, it's, it's not going to be a quick turnaround. So you have so many people make less because once you and go ahead and check out the census bureau because one of the things that you consistently see when you look up average income they will position household income which is about 59 or sixty two thousand dollars which is one two three four or five incomes because when you get into it and you start looking at what people make and where people live and how america's set up this really sets the stage for why so many people are catching economic hell. Here's the first problem. And this is something that they used to teach people in school that they took out to school. There used to be a course called home economics, and they would teach you how to set up your checking account and balance your checking book. They taught financial principles and also Back then, you did not have all of the enticements that you have today. There was no title lawn pawn. There was no rent to own. There was no credit cards. Credit cards, I think, came in the 50s. I'm not 100% sure when credit cards got started. And they were only pushed toward the well healed. So let's go back to 1960. Your father graduated high school. There are no credit cards. There are no loans. All you can do is work a job, save your money and make your purchases off that power. That was pretty much all you can do. There, there wasn't like credit existed back then, but it was more like character credit. 
if you went to a grocery store and the grocer knew you and your family and he may like extend you a credit of 50 bucks to buy groceries and you pay him next week that that type of credit existed all over america and it was character credit because if they knew you they knew your family they would extend you credit but if they didn't know you it wouldn't happen so as we started to evolve as a country as markets opened up and people figured out a way to make money um this wrecked the american middle class and i'm going to do a completely separate video on the middle class so i'm not going to get into that right now but when you look at why people only make x amount of dollars that's the question because right now during the great resignation all these people are leaving they're looking for better jobs they want to be treated better they want higher pay they want a better situation they want a better standard of living here is the problem with that first of all there are a lot of jobs that pay six figures computer data scientists computer cybersecurity and here's the problem with that to qualify for these jobs you have to take rigorous academic courses and right now, when you go ahead and look at how many people graduated with a STEM degree or a hard to get degree or an engineering degree, it's not that many. And that's the problem. Because right now with so many Americans, and let's talk about the pandemic, the two year part of the global reset. For the first time, many of these people realized time freedom. Now, what do I mean when I say time freedom? They had time to do what they want and they weren't being evicted. They weren't being foreclosed on. The repo man was a repo in their car. And I can tell you as a person who has experienced time freedom, it's addictive. When you can come and go as you please and still manage your bills. That's very, very addictive. And you don't want to go back to having to go to the office, having someone look at you. you is like this created such a disruption. And this is why the great resignation happened because people understood and felt that they can have life on their terms. Now, as we go through the global reset, you're going to see a lot of people, and I know this is going to sound strange, a lot of people who are working at home at some point are going to have to go back to the office. Now, there will be people, and let's go ahead and talk about the classification of the people who will not have to go back to the office. The people that are very hard to replace, that are very expensive employees, well-trained, extremely talented, and bring a lot to the table. Those classification of people will continue to be able to work at home. They will continue to do what they want. They will continue to have time, freedom and income coming in. Those folks will have that. But if you're not doing something highly technical and you don't have that type of job, you're going to be regulated back to the old way of things. You're going to be back in the office. And there are many jobs where you can like Amazon, associates they work in the warehouse there's no way that they can work from home if you work in the warehouse there's no way you can work from home if you drive a truck there's no way you can work from home if you're a plumber there's no way you could work from home if you're a construction worker there's no way that you can work from home so we're going to have a classification of jobs where these people will never ever be able to work from home Never, ever. Never going to happen. Didn't happen during the pandemic. It's not happening after the pandemic. And what you're going to see is a lot of dissatisfaction because now people know there's a better way. They know. And one of the things that I'm about to take advantage of, I'll be honest with you, is the number of people who are going to not walk fast to entrepreneurship they're going to be running because they're going to want 
they experience that time freedom. Now, here's the problem with entrepreneurship and that time freedom thing. In the beginning, it ain't there. In the beginning, there is no work-life balance. There's no free time. You're just grind. You're grinding, grinding, grinding. So that's the little wrinkle with that. But what we're going to have is we have a, and a lot of people disagree with me because uh, there's some comments I saw that like, once we get all rid of the people, see, here's the thing. There will be an economy of consumers to buy things. That's never going to disappear. That's never going to disappear. What's going to happen is that bottom social economic layer is going to dramatically rise. Now, here's the thing. These people, because of their low incomes, they do contribute to society. They buy groceries, they buy gas, but they don't contribute to the luxury economy. They don't contribute to the high end market economy. They don't. Now, if you will go to virtually any city, what are they building? High end apartments, high end homes. Why are they building these properties? They're not building them for the people on the lower economic strata. Who are they building them for? There's this book called Upshift. You can find it on Amazon. It talks about this and demographics. Believe it or not, currently we don't have enough housing for the population that we have. Currently, there is a housing shortage. And what builders are doing is they're building luxury high end housing for that coming market. They're not building like you virtually can you can virtually not find anyone constructing low income housing. Well, one of the reasons is there's not a lot of profit in it. So that's one of the reasons. And two, like where I live, there's probably 40 multi-billion dollar construction projects going on right now, 40. From high-end apartments to uh, luxurious homes to massive uh, uh, retail. Yes, retail. I know that sounds crazy. Retail development. That's going on right in my area right now. All I see when I roll around is cranes everywhere, cranes everywhere. Who are they building this for? They're building it for the superior economic class, the people who make over six figures. Now, as the number of people who economically fall is going to expand, strange things, the number of people who make over six figures is going to grow. Let me say that again. The number of people who make 150, 250, 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 million dollar year incomes is going to grow. And this is who they're building these apartments and these houses for. They don't really give a damn about the poor people. I, I mean, just to be 100% honest with you guys, no one gives a damn if you're poor and you're suffering. We have a lot of churches, we have a lot of charitable organizations that do give a damn and they try to help these people out. But the reality is we're about to experience an income polarization that has never been seen by society. We would have people out there struggling to put gas in their car, struggling to buy food to eat. And then we will have this one individual who is super talented that brings so much value to their company that their company is paying this person $300,000 a year. They get amazing perks. They get amazing benefits. They get free health care, and they're living an amazing life. And we're going to have what I like to call the multiple Americas. There is not one America. Now, the largest contingency in America are people in the income danger zone. 75% of America is in the income danger zone. That is the largest segment of America. But we're going to have a growing, let's call them comfortable class of people making 150, 250, 300. That's going to explode. That's going to explode. We're going to have entrepreneurs. We're going to, 
So get ready for the Hunger Games because it's going to be wild. It's going to be wild because I remember like in the last video, I was talking about the lady that rented my car who's going to be globally reset. Here is the problem that so many people, and I was talking about this, but I didn't touch on it when I talked about it in the beginning. People don't have skill sets. This is the issue. If you have an income problem, you have a skill set problem. That's the big issue. You have a skill set problem and because you have a skill set problem. This produces the income problem. And also to get even more pervasive, it also comes back to culture. I don't know if this guy's still alive. His name was William Raspberry. He was a columnist for multiple newspapers. And I read this article as a kid and he was talking about the expectations of the Jewish community. It was like, if you did not know, a lot of Jewish people are writers and there's a like if you go ahead and get into Jewish culture, you'll find there's a family of writers. Moms are writer, dads are writer, kids are writers. There is an expectation that if you're Jewish and you grow up in a certain family, you're going to do well. That's the expectation. And then let's talk about black folks. Why are there so many black folks who are really good at basketball? That's not an accident because from a cultural standpoint, you have so many kids devoting 10,000 hours, 20,000 hours, 30,000 hours to the craft of basketball. So if you have someone who has natural athletic abilities and they devote 30,000 hours to playing basketball, you got yourself an NBA player. That's the reality because they devote so much time to it because that's something you can do. That's for you to do. You can be, you can play basketball. You can do that. You can do that. And there are cultural walls because there are certain behaviors and activities that are for those people. It's not for me. It's for those people. So from a cultural perspective, this is why so many people have limited income. Like I was watching this documentary about prison and it was, it was heartbreaking. It was literally heartbreaking because this guy committed a crime at 17. He went to prison and he was getting out of prison at the age of 27. He's never had a cell phone. He's never driven a car. And you have this person who is uneducated unaware and from a social perspective, completely blunt, isn't aware of social clues, doesn't know how to conduct themselves. And there's this term that I heard them use in the documentary called institutionalized, that these people can't cope on the outside because they've been institutionalized and they're more comfortable in prison than being free. Let me say that again. They're more comfortable in prison than being free. So culture and environment has a lot to do with this. It's not some fat cat in the cloud saying you will be rich. You won't be rich. That's not it. It is cultural behaviors. I've talked about this before. This study they did of these little smart kids both poor and well off and the kids who came from a resource rich environment did very, very well. And the kids, even though they were academically and from an IQ standpoint on par with the upper class kids from an intellectual standpoint, because they were in a resource deficient environment, they didn't do well, even though they were smart. So, you need more than being smart. Like I'll take myself. Um, for me, YouTube is a resource rich environment. YouTube, the online is just for me, it's so full of resources. There's so many things. There's so much information out here, right? 
And when I came to YouTube, three years after I came to YouTube, I became a millionaire because of this research rich environment. There was so much opportunity. And I will state, and I know there are many people who feel that, no, you can't do it now, it's too crowded. I would vigorously disagree with it. I feel that if you bring something special to the YouTube platform, you can blow up. You can blow up. So check out Kelly Stamps. She's very funny and her channel has blown up. So once you take your talents to a resource rich environment, you can get rich. But if you are in a situation, because once again, 75% of America is in the income danger zone. 75% of Americans make less than $50,000 per year, single person income. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that? First of all, and you know, I'm about to say something about guys. We see someone, she's pretty, we wanna have sex with her. We go ahead and next thing you know, she's pregnant. That right there, that, that scenario that happens over and over and over again is the primary reason that people are in income danger zone number one. Why, she's pregnant? Oh, I gotta get a real job. So you go out and get you a job, you know, you do, she, she goes to the hospital, she has the baby, she comes home, and now you're a family, and you are a low income family because you, and also, because you were unaware, because typically, if you were fortunate, like I had a friend who was extremely fortunate, his mom and dad sat him down and told him, you do not want to get a girl pregnant before you're married. And then his dad, his dad was super successful. His dad was a millionaire. And they told him the playbook. This is what you do. You go ahead and you get yourself together before you enter into a serious relationship. And his folks, you know, nice people. I met them a few times. His folks were such a successful model. He actually listened to them. Cause you know, he would date and stuff, but he wouldn't get serious. Cause he's like, I am not where I need to be as a man. So I can't really get serious with you. And he would cut it off and he would move to the next one. He cut it off. And then once he had where he needed to be, uh, he had a company, he was making six figures. He had no debt. He had his own house at that point. Then he would date someone and he met this girl and they got serious and they got married and they're still married to this day. And they have three kids. See, from an educational perspective, we don't have someone telling us when we are, during those formative years, what's gonna happen if we do certain things. Um, I remember a weird conversation with my mom. It's like, if you get a girl pregnant, just bring the baby home. I was like, I'm not gonna do that. It's my intentions not to get a girl pregnant. And I didn't get the girl pregnant until I got married. So one of the things that happens is living your life and behavior. Behavior is 100% behind why people are in the income danger zone number one. Now, I'm gonna say no one actually, cause a lot of us, I can't say your parents were bad people or anything. They didn't know what they didn't know. And like my friend who was extremely fortunate, his parents are alive today and they have a great relationship. He was lucky to have parents who sat him down and they sat him down. He, he said, he, he told me, he said, I remember, it, it wasn't just one conversation, it was several conversations. His dad was like, you are a man, you need to get yourself together, you need to be established before you get married. Some of the best advice because what you know, this is one of the things that I get into in the Lost Kings. As a man, you need to be set. You need to be at a certain level before you get serious with a woman, before you start having children. That having kids before you're ready is one of the number one reasons that people are in the social underclass. 
number one and what they do is they have kids and the kids see the model oh this is my mom this is my dad they're not married but I am loved and I get to go to parties and every weekend my dad picks me up so guess what little Jody and little Susie they mirror that behavior when they get of age so the cycle keeps repeating itself over and over and over and over and with the repeating of this cycle the same consequences happen over and over and over at the moment I know of personally 10 people who are going to be globally reset 10 and as I talk to them because you know I cannot save the world I cannot save the world I, I've not put on a cape and like I'm going to do all this because essentially uh, just trying to save these 10 people would literally financially run me <laughs> it really would because they got few of them got some heavy needs, got some six figure needs. I mean, it, it was just like, wow, that's who knew that a person could get in that much debt. But as I look into their stories and I listen to them, I hear the same themes over and over and over again. The same themes, the same themes, the same themes. I was like, ah, this is why, this is why. So if you're in income danger zone, and this is something that we'll be talking about, you need to work as hard as you can to get out of income danger zone because here's the problem. There's a hundred and support a hundred. I don't know the numbers, but it was before the pandemic, 160 million people in the workforce, right? 80 million of those people made $30,000 a year or less. And let's talk about those 80 million people. You don't have enough money to invest. You really don't have enough money to save because if you're making $30,000 a year, that means you're bringing home 2K a month. Average rent is a thousand bucks across the country. And then when you get into the cities, average rent is 15, 1800. You're only making 2000. So this is forcing people to be into relationships that maybe they wouldn't be into if they didn't have to be with these people. Because it's like you make two thousand, she makes two thousand. You pay the rent, she gets everything else. So th this this is creating a lot of social situations based upon economic need versus true love and desire. This is what's opened up the door. So one of the things that you will have to understand, because I'll be talking about the income danger zone number one. It is such a slippery slope because all it takes is just one thing, unemployment, a health crisis, maybe an accident or something or a global pandemic to knock you off your financial axis. And now you are struggling. Now you are in deep, deep doo-doo. Now you're in that spot where life just overcomes you you got a little job and you're barely paying the bills then you lose that job for six months then everything gets behind it could literally take you two years to get back to normal and then during this period there's this two this six month period of unemployment will impact your income for the next 10 years so it is a very slippery slope, and this is why so many people are positioned to be globally reset. It's not like these folks want to be globally reset. I feel that it's a lot of people who are unaware of what's going on. They really, really don't know. All they know is, my life sucks. That's what they know. And they just like, and they're like, and they, they want to look at it from a moral standpoint. I'm a good person. I go to church, I take care of my mom. Why has all this bad stuff happened to me? And I'm going to say something that's going to be very controversial. Success doesn't care if you're moral or not. I know that's going to be a hot topic. That's going to be very controversial, but success doesn't care 
if you are moral or not. Doesn't care. Success doesn't bring that into the table. So there's a lot of people who are good people, honest people, Christian folk who do the right thing, live the right life. They don't bother nobody. They don't hurt nobody. And they're like, why does my life suck? Morality has nothing to do with it. Um, to go a little dark, there are people walking around who have killed someone who are living amazing lives. Do you know that about 40% of murders go unsolved? So that means that someone kills somebody and they're going home to their beautiful wife, their family, living a life, taking vacations and living a good life, even though they did something heinous. They took another life. I, I, I study stuff like that. I'm a weird guy. I know I study stuff like that. But so if you can pull the morality out, because the morality brings with it a lot of expectations, a lot of um, I'm a good person. I should be doing well. Those two are not equivalents because you're a good person and doing well. Those two have nothing to do with each other. And I know that's going to be really controversial because there's a lot of good people out there who live a good life, who do the right thing and they're suffering and they're trying to correlate. I'm a good person and why my life sucks when that shouldn't even be in the equation because you can be an extremely bad person and have an amazing life if you do the right things because it's about your behavior going back to why so many people are in income danger zone number one it goes back to habit it goes back to behavior it goes back to culture see if you're in a certain culture that can pretty much predict your life scientists and once again, they, they look at third grade reading scores. I thought this was just an excuse, but no, they start building prisons based upon third grade reading scores because they know that these people have bad reading scores that they're not going to be able to gainfully participate in the first layer economy and that the proclivity of stepping up into crime is so high that they start looking. So if you're in an area with a bunch of really low reading scores, there very well can be a prison built in your neighborhood. I know that's very, very dicey. That's really, really bad, but I'm just here to let you know. Now, one of the things I'm getting ready to do, uh, I already sent this email out and I'm gonna add this because January is gonna be a really, really busy, busy month. But I'm getting ready to create some training on how, first of all, let's go ahead and have this conversation. A lot of people have bad credit, not because they're bad people. That had nothing to do with it. They have bad credit because they don't have enough money. That's the primary reason because I look at myself and I look at other people. I don't really have a lot of expensive habits. Uh, I don't just like go online and just shop and buy stuff. And I don't have a whole bunch of stuff in my house and I don't, I don't, I don't do that. And the average person doesn't do that. So the average credit score is like 620, hundred million people have a credit score of 620. But once again, if you look at the same demographic, these are the people who are making less than $30,000 a year. So when you look at the income, you look at the behavior, the results make sense. So one of the things I'm getting ready to do is start a credit repair company and an income appreciation company. I uh, may have it. I don't know if I'm going to have it done by this video, but essentially what we're going to do is I'm going to educate you on credit, fix your credit. That's going to be part of the service, teach you how to start a small business, and teach you how to manage your money. So you get your credit fixed, you get a new income skill and you learn how to manage money. So you get three very serious things because here's the thing. If you can boost your income to $60,000 as a single person and have really good money management skills, because I know I made the video 
six figures isn't enough. And from an inflationary standpoint, six, people making six figures are catching hell because they can't, you know, depending on where they live, they can't afford houses and stuff. But I'm going to put together a program to help you be successful, fix your credit, fix your income problem, and fix your money management problem. Because I used to be just like you. I didn't know all this stuff. I had no clue. It was just when I started the business and then, you know, starting the business, you get exposed to a lot of things real quick, like bam, 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 bam. And it exposed me to a lot of things. I got exposed to a lot of people. So I learned, I started learning literally day one, I started my business. So there are lessons and things that I learned because I started the business that you are completely unaware of because you have not started a business. So give me a little time to get that together because um, during the Great Reset, there will be massive opportunity for the people who are willing to work. Now, there's a lot of people who want to be an Instagram star or a YouTuber or something because they, they, like, they want to put up maybe one or two videos a week and that's the totality of all the work they do. If you can get that work, it's, it pays well. If you can get it, it pays well. I mean, you can make a grip. I'm, I know people, I'm, I've got friends who are YouTubers, I personally know make a million a month. A million a month. Every month and the money comes in like clockwork. So if you can get it, it pays very, very well. But for the average person that goes back to behaviors, because all YouTubers I know that make that kind of money are obsessed with YouTube and they work 60 hours a week. See, that's the thing that you don't see when you see these YouTubers. You don't see that the, the, the obsession over thumbnails and you don't see all that. You just see, hey, he does a YouTube video. He looks like he's having fun. He makes all his money. I'm going to tell you, if you have a successful YouTube channel, you're working. You're working quite a bit, quite a bit. So yeah, um, one of the things that is happening is I feel that people are frustrated, people are upset, people are mad, and people are looking for a savior. And once again, there ain't no one coming to save you. There ain't no one coming to save you. I know that sucks. I know that sounds really bad, but there is no one coming to save you. No one. You gotta sew your own cape and be become your own superhero and save yourself because if you are not um, doing that um, it's it's very very bad it's very very bad so one of the things that you have to do and have to understand because I'm, I'm getting ready to start having some master classes too so we will look out for that is understanding the environment in which you're operating. That is so important because once you understand the environment, then you know how to operate in the environment. But if you don't understand the environment, you could actually unconsciously do things that violate the terms of the environment. And next thing you know, you're being punished and you were completely unaware because you didn't know what you were dealing with. That's a big part of America because ask yourself, like years and years ago, when I was got first introduced to the apparel mark, I didn't understand why there were so many immigrant business owners. I had no clue to why. I was like, why are all these immigrants here? I was seeing Asians, Pakistanis, Armenians. I was just like, just boom, 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 boom. See, where these folks come from, you cannot do what you can do in America. So they already know that what you can do in America, you cannot do back home in Armenia or Pakistani or Seoul. Well, maybe Seoul. Seoul's, Seoul, Seoul is lit. Seoul's, there's a lot of things happening in Korea, but maybe Vietnam, maybe Israel, uh, the Middle East. You can't do these things. You can't. And these folks know it and they come here and they take full advantage of the opportunity where you, the indigenous American, are completely unaware because you don't know what you don't know. 
you don't know what you don't know. You, you have no clue to what's going on. So you are just kind of like feeling your way around. And the next thing you know, you're 65 and broke because no one told you how the game works. And once again, the reason that so many people are in income danger zone, number one, isn't because there's, you know, there, I see a lot of comments. It's the elite. It's the people that are trying to keep the man down. I'm going to say something that may sound a little off base. Do you think money is scarce? I guarantee you everyone that you know has some money. They may not have a lot of money, but they have, a, they have some money, which means money ain't scarce. Money ain't scarce. The income skills to get the money. That's what's scarce. Money itself is not scarce. Money is a plentiful. It's abundant. Money is all around us. What is hard to get your hands on is the skills to get that money. But money itself is not scarce. If you give people what they want, they will give you money. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. They will hand you a lot of money if you give them a lot of what they want. It's just that simple. So we'll be talking about this, but yeah. So this is my, you know, I'll probably do a few more videos about the income danger zone. Number one, because there's so many people in it and um, a lot of people don't understand America. They really don't understand America. Uh, many years ago, I was like you. I didn't understand America. I had no clue to how this country worked. I had no clue. And I'm going to tell you something. It's kind of gone back to the way this country was founded. If you know history, only land owners could vote back in the day. Right? Guess who's controlling Congress right now? Corporations. Because they own a lot of corporate land. Yes, you and I can go to the booth and vote. We can. But your vote has more power in a local election than it does in a national election because of corporate interest. So when I was a kid. There was the saying, if you can't beat them, join them. And that's what I'm telling you, because once again, uh, the things that are happening, man. If you're a corporate citizen and you understand America, your life will be good. But if you are someone who's on this, I'm a good person, they should do this, it's just the right thing to do type of vibe, you're going to continue to suffer. You're going to continue to suffer. So that's all I got for you guys. Let me know. I'll be putting these packages together, these trainings, these conversations and stuff. And this is something else that I'm doing. And I'm going to put this out because I already um, running test on it. I get a lot of people who want to talk to me. And I really appreciate that, but I run multiple businesses and I don't have free time to just sit and kick it with you. I don't. I mean, seriously, I barely have time for the girl I'm dating. So I don't have time to just get on the phone and chit chat. And I have a lot of people, you know, my consulting rate is 2,500 bucks per hour and I get it. So what I'm getting ready to do for folks who want to chat. I'm going to do group coaching calls. Whether you can do is sign up at B school for hustlers. And once I get 10 people, then I'm going to have a zoom call where you can ask all your questions. And I feel that if we have 10 people who want to start a business who are curious, I feel that this is going to be some good energy. I feel this is going to be some good juju and it's going to help you. So what I'm going to do, is I've created a, uh, like an online course. It's not a course, but you go ahead and buy it. And all of the recorded calls I will place there. So when you sign up, you can listen to all of the calls and you can get your business education. So that's the repository that I'm going to create. I'm, like I said, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I, I, I get so many people who's like, how can I get in contact with you? And I'm like, I don't, I don't answer because I don't want to. Let me say this the right way. I am so busy and 
I don't want to start like, hey, let's start a little chat because essentially this is something I used to do. And it don't start, it starts off like I got a few questions, right? And I remember I was on the phone with this guy for an hour and a half, hour and a half, wasn't making no money. And I learned very quickly that a lot of people will quiz you, ask you a bunch of questions, and they will do absolutely nothing with the information. So uh, this is something new that I'm doing, group coaching. So essentially what you'll do is you'll sign up, it's 250. And what we'll do is once we get 10 people on, I will give a prompt, then you can start to answer your questions and every person will get their few questions answered during that call. And then sign up. Every time I get 10 people, I'll go ahead and send all 10 people a notification of the time and place for the Zoom call, which will be after 7 p.m. because I know most people are working and we will we'll we'll see how that goes. All right. So that link will be below. And that's all I got for you guys. So I will talk to you in the next one.